on, clap your hands. That's it. Here we go. Water you turned into wine. You opened the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. Not like you. Into the darkness we shine And out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you Not like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power Our God our God, oh! Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise, there's no one light. There is none like you, like you, like you, oh, 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 our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than Awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand again? 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 Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than stand against and if our God is for us then who could ever stop us and if our God is with us then what can stand again 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 Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord God. We honor you, Lord. You're worthy of our worship this morning. You are higher. You are higher. We lift up our worship. We lift you high this morning. Hallelujah. 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 The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's be seated in his presence as we continue to bless the Lord for the birth of Jesus and sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. i 
sing and heaven and the nature sing joy to the world the savior reigns let men their songs employ while fields and floods crop seals and plains repeat the sounding joy Repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness. Wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. Amen. Joy to the world. We want to thank uh, Stephanie and I want to thank all of you for your kindness, your wonderful uh Gifts at Christmas and Stephanie's birthday followed uh, Christmas. All, all of our these things come way too close together. But uh, God bless you for thinking about us, and uh, we so dearly appreciate the gestures. And more than anything, we just appreciate all of you. And uh, we want to remind you, Stephanie, you can tell you about Wednesday service. Yes. Um, so you know, I was thinking this morning. Uh, for a while, I attended uh, uh, Central Christian Church. You guys probably heard of that great big church. And uh, when they were expanding and building that church, they got to name some a couple of the streets uh, by the church. And one of the churches they named New Beginning, uh, not church, the road. They named it New Beginnings Street or Road. And I thought, you know, that hit me this morning that it's so wonderful. I mean, every day is a new beginning with the Lord. Every day he forgives us and we have a fresh start. But it is exciting to have the beginning of the year, isn't it? And hopefully we'll have some goals and things we want to accomplish. Um, and so I mentioned that because Wednesday night we would love to have any of you that don't, don't normally come on Wednesday night, if you give it a try. Uh, we meet at 6.45 and I can tell you it's one delicious time oh, every Wednesday night, I guarantee that. Yeah. Uh, and it's also, and physically. Yeah. yeah, and it's also meaty spiritually, so try to join us, uh, give it a shot. And um, also we meet every uh, Saturday, every other Saturday I should say, for one hour of prayer from 11 to 12 right here at the church. And so we'd encourage you to do that too. Uh, we met yesterday, so our next uh, Saturday will be a week from, or two weeks from yesterday, which is the January 14th. Boy, it's hard to be, think yeah. about January 14th already, isn't it? That's uh, George's birthday. Yes, it is. Yeah, yes, it is. Um, Stephanie and I are excited because one of our Christmas gifts is going to Israel in October. And uh, yeah, well, is that because we're going to be gone? Uh, how do you know? But anyway, we'd like to invite you, if uh, that would be on your hearts, uh, we're going to go with Barry Perez. Now, Barry will be here in uh, March, and uh, it's, it's his tour, and of course, uh, he will help guide it, but they also will have an Israeli uh, Jewish Christian believer who will be uh, doing the tour, on the, uh, starting on the 16th, I believe, right? 16th through, what are those dates? Anyway, it's the middle of October, 16th through the 25th, I think. So uh, if you have any interest at all in going to Israel, uh, pray about it yes. and uh, see us. And uh, we've got a number of months to uh, make a decision on that. And then I'm very excited because I'm coming up to the 10th anniversary of my seventh birthday. And my birthday is uh, the 9th of January, and those of you who've been here a while, I know you, you generally come in with gifts, and it's just too soon after Christmas. So here's what we're going to do this year to celebrate. We're going to meet on Saturday, the 21st of uh, January at 6 o'clock, and we're going to have a, a humdinger of a celebration. We're going to have entertainment to uh, get started, and then we're going to have dinner together. So uh, well, that invitation is open to all of you, and I don't want you to bring gifts for me. I have plenty, 
uh, when we come up to that date, uh, you, if you want to do anything to honor me, uh, make a donation to the church. So that's, that's the way we'll do it. So anyway, yeah, so it's going to be a lot of fun. We're working on it, and uh, I'm excited about it. Just great to be alive, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, I think yes. that's it. Exciting that's all stuff we... coming up. And I'd like to bring up Bing Mari as one quick announcement. That's what Pastor Del Bill always does. A quick announcement. Uh -huh. I think I'm on every mailing list in the country, but uh, starting out the new year, 2023, I brought in a box of 100 2023 calendars. If anybody wants one, please help yourself. There's lots of them out there. They represent probably every charity known to man, but uh, just help yourself and pick the one you like. Thank you, Imar. And I'm going to bring forward Jim Popovich this morning. He's going to pray for the offering. And I, you know what? I'm going to invite you hosts to come up at the same time. And you'll be all prepared. To, uh... Good morning, church family. Happy New Year. When Pastor asked me to uh, come up and uh, uh, pray for the offering, I, I find it a blessing and an honor to do so. And I started thinking about if I should share a... Uh, a um, particular verse or something like that, but uh, we all know that uh, when we tithe our gifts, our offerings, we're returning to God. It's all God's. It's not ours. We're returning to God, and He honors what we return to Him. He honors it how many fold times is uncountable. So I started thinking actually about uh, where our offerings go, what happens to them. And we have some obvious things, obviously the rent on this place, the electricity bill that, that lights and warms this place, um, special gifts and offerings that buy well, this beautiful piano up here, the chairs we sit on, the improvements in the, uh, the, the um, family tree, the carpet that we walk on. But then I thought there's so much more than that uh, that's tangible to us right here that uh, we, of course, as a church, we support Hoving Home, we support uh, Teen Challenge, we support um, uh, Women's uh, Resource Center, uh, we support missionaries um, in this country and worldwide. And then I started thinking, well, if that's the case, then what does our money do, our tithing, I shouldn't use the word money, although this is what it is, our, our, our offerings and tithings, what does it do? Does it bring a young man off the streets and out of drugs that we don't know about, but it's planted there. Do, does it um, save a woman who may be in an abusive situation um, and otherwise wouldn't have a, a bed and a place where people are mentoring her? Uh, little kids in the Philippines that otherwise wouldn't have the blessing of a place to go to hear God's word planted in them at a young age, um, a baby that might otherwise fate, uh, face an awful, awful fate that mm -hmm. through the blessings of, of um, tithings that uh, come through, the mother has changed her mind. So I just wanted you to keep that in mind that there's so much that God does with these stuff that we can see, but so much stuff that we can't see. And we may never know, but we know that it happens. We know God is faithful and, and we know that that uh, our offerings that are given, uh, the return to him uh, out of a, uh, uh, just a, a giving and happy heart, he honors that. So Amen. with that, we'll say the, um, pray for this uh, offering. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for this brand new year, Lord, for all that it holds in store, Lord. We know that uh, even though we can't uh, predict the future, we know one thing, that you're always there for us, Lord. And uh, we just uh, lift up this uh, offering to you this morning, Lord. We pray that uh, uh, it is uh, used, Lord, uh, in a, uh, a way that uh, is a blessing um, returned to you and a blessing to others that we don't know, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord's Prayer. Yeah. The Lord's Prayer. Yeah. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. And uh, before we do our sermon today, while the offering is being passed, uh, we have a video. thought this song was really uh, apropos for what we're uh, going to be talking about today. Uh, some of you may remember way back in the 60s, uh, the group, The Seekers, that sang Georgie Girl and a number of others hits. And so this is a great song to start, start off the year. Follow your dream to the end of the road, yeah. I love those lyrics. Imagine if Columbus had not dreamt the world was round and if uh, people had not walked on the moon. The things that have been accomplished through dreams, that's what we're going to talk about today in a sermon titled Field of Dreams. Do we have that? Yeah. It's not spelled wrong. You know, it's based on, uh, it's a little play on words of the wonderful film Field of Dreams. But are you filled of dreams in this new year, 2023. And I'm not talking about the dreams that we dream at night and that we wake up from, but I'm talking about the dreams that come into our heart that make us wake up to something. Dreams, the desires, the goals that awaken in us a new purpose, a new direction, a new challenge. Dreams that make our hearts beat hard and make us glad to be alive. It's been said, always dare to dream. For as long as there's a dream, there is hope. And as long as there is hope, there is joy in living. When I was 19, I was in my sophomore year at Grove City College. And uh, my plan was to uh, become a high school teacher, English teacher, and uh, go right back to the high school I graduated from and teach there and spend my life in this nice, safe, uh, wonderful 
little community. And uh, my sister and I had uh, begun sometime during that year uh, when I would come home on weekends. We would watch Sonny and Cher, uh, the old TV show, and we started doing an impression of them in our living room. And uh, we had never uh, really impersonated celebrities before. We would mock our relatives and uh, friends and school teachers. <laughs> but anyway, we began to do this little impression and once we kind of got it down, we hosted a talent contest at uh, our high school. And uh, after we did that, we kind of emceed uh, between acts in this contest. And after we did that show, we began to get calls from various clubs in the area, uh, like ladies' lunches, uh, Kiwanis clubs, that wanted entertainment for an upcoming banquet. And I would tell them, well, we have a fee, it's $50. Even in 1972, $50 was not a lot of money when we had three musicians to pay and two of us. So uh, then they would call me back and say they didn't have the funds for that. And I would be very disappointed until finally, uh, my sister, uh, one of her teachers at, uh, in the school said he uh, would like to hire us to sing at their bowling banquet, which was really big back in that area in the spring. So I came home two weeks before this show was supposed to be and we still didn't know if it was going on. And I, so, so I, I called the man and his name was Mr. Kensick. He said, Mr. Kensick, this is Bill Walker. Uh, uh, do you want us to perform at your bowling banquet or not? He said, well, okay, but if we're gonna pay you $50, we want an hour show. Well, we didn't even have a minute show at that point. We had two weeks and I had final exams coming up, but we, got a book by our piano, 101 songs to sing at parties, you know, with things like Alexander's Ragtime Band, songs like that. But they had a couple of hip songs like Spinning Wheel and Come Saturday Morning. And uh, so we put this show together, you know, we did our little Sunny and Cher thing. And uh, we, uh, I did a couple of songs from the book and my sister did an impression of Barbara Streisand. And uh, there we were in that, uh, it was the last day of my last final exam at, uh, in my sophomore year that we did this show and I did that in the morning and then we rehearsed in the afternoon and we did this show at night in a high school auditorium for about 50 people and my parents were there. And the applause, and they gave us a standing ovation at the end, you know. And when the show was over, the man that hired us and insisted on uh, an hour show for $50 came running up to me with this envelope with cash in it and he said, I'm terribly sorry, I should be paying you much more than this. I'm gonna tell everybody I know about you guys. So, right then and there, I made up my mind. I'm not going back to college. This is what I wanna do. Now, all it was was an was a instant dream in, in my heart. We didn't have a job on the books. We didn't have a booking agent. We didn't have any equipment, costumes, arrangements, sound equipment that we would end up needing. We knew how to get up in front of people, but we really didn't have any real professional experience. We really didn't have an act. We didn't have a clue about what professional entertainment was all about. We didn't know anyone who could tell us how to get into show business. We had absolutely no connections and all we had was a dream. And within the first few months, we got some agents in the Pittsburgh area and we played, uh, we got a booking at the biggest nightclub in the Pittsburgh area that brought in all the stars at that time, like Tony Orlando and Don and uh, Phyllis Diller, uh, Mama Cass Elliot, uh, uh, people of that ilk. Now, grant, granted, it was on the off nights, it was on Sunday through Thursday, but when you have a girl that's still in high school and I'm 19 and my brother's 21, it was something. We started doing local television uh, within the first year uh, after we made that decision to uh, go at performing, we were flown out here to Las Vegas to audition at the Sands Hotel by the manager we had back in Pittsburgh. And within a year and a half, we were moved out here to live out here and began working at the Landmark Hotel. By the time I was 24, within the first five years, we had signed a contract at Harris uh, on the Strip, which was originally the Holiday Casino. We ended up being there for 10 years and we began doing national television at that time and did a string of national television shows. It was an amazing three decades of our career. We retired about uh, 20 years ago. And the reason I'm speaking to you all here and the whole direction of my life is because of that dream way back in 1972. I had a college professor, a French professor by the name of Céline Léon. She was from 
Paris. And uh, after I left college, I stayed in contact with her. And when I would go home to Pennsylvania, I'd always make a trip up to the college and visit with her. And I'll never forget her saying to me, you're a dreamer, but somehow it seems to work out for you. Psalm 37.4 in the New King James Version says this, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, on the one hand, when we look at that verse, I believe that when God is our delight, when we put him first, he, he does these very personal blessings for us that make us know that he loves us. And it's very much like uh, Stephanie and I for our grandchildren once removed, Grace and, and uh, Georgia, who are really our uh, grand niece and nephew. We got them exactly what they wanted for Christmas. Georgia uh, is now almost nine years old. She wanted gift cards to Target. She wants to buy her own stuff now. And Grayson wanted Legos. So that's exactly what we got them. And that's what God does with us a lot of times. He does blessings to us and gives us just fingerprints are all over it. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. But I think beyond that and just as uh, poignant is that we make God our delight. He actually puts the desires in us to guide us in the direction he wants us to go. Sometimes we think it's our own thought, but it comes from God. And I found a number of times in my life when I knew that what came into my heart was from God. And I believe in spite of my 19 year old naivete and my self focus and insecurity, that yearning to be in show business came from God. And thank God we came into a relationship with Jesus a year into our career, because I don't know how we would have survived it without knowing Jesus. It radically changed the direction of my life and the location of my life and led me to what I'm doing right now. And God didn't train me for this in the classroom as much as he trained me for this in the showroom. Somebody said today's realities are yesterday's dreams. Think about that. Today's realities, what you're experiencing today, in many cases, are because of what you dreamed years ago. Now, we all know that God gave Joseph dreams. Joseph had dreams about where he was going to be years down the road. God showed him that. And we also know that Joseph had the ability through God to interpret the dreams of other people and let them know what God was speaking to them. And we see the same thing with Daniel who had dreams and interpreted dreams. And, and Daniel spoke into the future and we have his prophecies about the end times uh, recorded in the book of Daniel. But we're not talking today about the prophetic or visions for the future. We're talking about those heartfelt desires and the yearnings that cause a person to move forward toward that dream. All men, it's been said, are men, all men of action are dreamers. And you could list, you know, people throughout history. Elon Musk, Thomas Edison, Walt Disney, Jonas Salk, Ronald Reagan, Henry Ford. They've been thinking about Sonny Bono. <laughs> Sonny Bono. I mean, the guy really couldn't sing, right? <laughs> he wrote a couple songs, and he became a singer, and an entertainer, and a performer, and an actor. And then as he phased out from that, he uh, became an entrepreneur, opened a restaurant in Palm Springs, got irritated because uh, he didn't like uh, some of the rules that were going on with business, so he ran for mayor of Palm Springs. That's a dreamer. Became the mayor of Palm Springs, and then he ran for Congress. Sonny Bono became a congressman. That's a dreamer, people. Nehemiah, when we look at uh, examples in the Bible of dreamers, dreams that are put into action, read the book of Nehemiah. When you go home this week, uh, Read through Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah, actually, uh, the Hebrew Bible, they're one book. And it's all about the Jews returning from captivity in Babylon uh, to their homeland in Israel. And Nehemiah, uh, they had already returned about 100 years before when we begin reading Nehemiah. The Jews had returned to their homeland. Uh, King Cyrus had given them permission to go back home after 70 years of captivity. And they resettled their land. But Nehemiah, some of, many of the Jews, there are only about 50,000 Jews returned from the millions of Jews at that time. Only about 50,000 returned because many of the Jews had become comfortable 
in, in a foreign land. They had a life there. And Nehemiah was one of those. And he was the cupbearer for the court, uh, in the court of King Artaxerxes. See that real fast five times. Artaxerxes. And uh, he was in a position of high honor. And it was a life of ease and luxury and security. But when he was told about the sorry condition of his people in Jerusalem, how the walls were broken down and their enemies were coming in and tormenting them and keeping them from building the wall, he had a dream in his heart. He wanted to see his people secure. He wanted to see them restored. And instead of complaining or getting uh, depressed about the situation, he asked King Artaxerxes for permission to leave his high position and go to his, what would be his homeland in Israel. He had never been 900 miles away in Jerusalem before this time. But again, he had that dream. And then it took him four months even to travel there by caravan. But when he got there and arrived in Jerusalem, he came with the authority to be the governor of that settlement and also to rebuild the city walls. He encouraged the people to begin immediately rebuilding and from the moment he arrived, everybody knew who was in charge. When the building project began, he managed, he supervised, he encouraged. He faced great opp opposition from the enemies of Israel and even from within his own people. But he confronted injustice and he kept going until the walls were built. And miraculously, that wall was finished in just 52 days. Even their enemies knew that God was involved in it. But it began with a dream in Nehemiah's heart. Once Nehemiah got the people secure from their enemies, he began to bring them back to their faith in God and a revival broke out. It's an amazing, amazing story that begins with a dream. Walt Disney, anybody ever hear of him? He said this, all dreams can come true if you have the courage to pursue them. Now I brought this out last year. I did a sermon not uh, different from this, but uh, on the first... But there's one economic uh, plan that I have in the year. It's the only one. That's why I'm married to Stephanie. She does the finances. <laughs> but on the day after Christmas, I run to the mall to buy a calendar at half off. But thanks to Joe Biden, they're only 40% off this year. <laughs> but I ran and I got my calendar. And I get this John Sloan calendar because the artwork is just like fabulous in there. But what I love is when you open up a brand new calendar, all these spaces in there, you know. It's just so there's nothing written on it yet. Now, I do have a planner at home, and I already have some things scheduled. But all these nice spaces, and every one of these spaces represents opportunity. It, op it represents chances. Do you have dreams and goals and expectations and desires that you want to see accomplished by this time next year? Harvey McKay said this, when you have a dream that you can't let go of, trust your instincts and pursue it. But remember, real dreams take work. They take patience and sometimes they require you to dig down very deep. Be sure you're willing to do that. Dreaming is the easy part. It's the exciting part. It's the part that gets the engine revved up. The part that gets your heart pounding. Yeah! But it's just the first step to success and after the initial dream and the desire and the yearning and the goal comes work right and patience and I could say grit or determination when I was in eighth grade I had an epiphany I had a moment of revelation if, if you will my brother and I uh, would always play after school and uh, we were both uh, average students because we just didn't have a lot of interest in homework or paying real close attention in school. And when we bring home a report card filled with C's, thank God I had parents that would say, you're better than this. You can do better than this. You know, things come into you and they kind of stick there. At any rate, in sixth grade, uh, a little boy by the name of Jimmy Mitchell moved into the vacant farm behind us. And he and I became friends and then when we moved into seventh grade, we had this habit with Jimmy and me and my brother and another next door neighbor, David. We would, the four of us boys out in the country, we would play together after school. We'd play touch football and this and this and this, and, you know, run around. When we got into seventh grade, they 
separate us uh, into groups according to our grade average. So Jimmy was in the A group. And Jimmy was in the A group because Jimmy had a photographic mind. He could see the book and be the book. You know, he would read, he'd hear, and he had it. But Greg, my brother, and I, and my next door neighbor, David, we had to work. But we didn't want to work. We liked to play. So I wasn't really happy in that C group because I knew it was better than that, but it just didn't motivate me. So I went through seventh grade in the C group, and then I got into eighth grade, and this is when the epiphany began. I went into my first class, and I found out I was in the, well, I came to term them the Jacques Cousteau Club. Their grades were below sea level. <laughs> and I thought, there's a clerical error. I'm in here, the kind of kids, these are the kids that like eighth grade, you know, you're 12 years old, have five o'clock shadow, and put their own tattoos with a pen in their arm, you know, and those are the girls. So I'm sitting through this class with angst and I'm thinking, it's a clerical error. I'm, I'm sure it's just one class and my next class I'll be reunited you know, at a higher level back to the C group. So as soon as the bell rang for the uh, end of the class, I, I ran to the next class and I remember running into the empty room and taking my seats and waiting for my C friends to come in. But in came the uh, group I had just been with. <laughs> And for whatever reason, they didn't make good grades. Maybe they just didn't have the mental capacity. Maybe they didn't have the oomph. I don't know. But that still didn't wake me up until one day after school, like so many other days, my brother and I and David and Jimmy came home on the school bus, and we all ran home and put on our play clothes. Remember the days when you wore nice clothes to school, and then you had to put on your play clothes? And then Greg and David and I ran over the hill down in the country to Jim Mitchell's barn to play, and Jim was there with another little friend of his that was visiting from town. And somewhere during our playtime, Jim and his friend locked my brother and me and David in one of the storage sheds in the barn. Now, it's not like we couldn't breathe, because, you know, you're in a barn, you know, there's space between the boards of the barn, I could see the sunlight coming in. But that's when I had the epiphany. My brother and David were pounding on the store, let us out, let us out, let us out. And I just stood there, and I had this revelation. I thought, wait a minute. I'm giving up my future. I'm giving up good grades. I'm giving up self-respect to play with a kid that's locking me in the barn when another kid comes along. I'm paying, uh, there's a cost I'm paying for this, and it's not costing Jim any, anything because he makes good grades just by showing up. So I stood there and I thought, when I get out of here, I'm done playing. I'm going to do homework. So I don't know how long we were in there, 10 minutes or so. Suddenly the door flew open and my brother and David flew into Jim and his friend and they're all laughing and carrying on and I just marched through them and I left that barn and I went up the hill to my house and into my bedroom to study and I couldn't do anything. I didn't bring any books home that night. <laughs> but the next day I paid attention in class. I took notes. I brought the books home. I, when I got home, I went to that room, and I started on my homework, and I stayed there from the time I got home from school until I went to bed, only stopping to have dinner. And that became my modus operandi all through high school. And amazingly, the very next report card, my grades went up. And I was uh, inducted into the National Honor Society, and I had those same habits in college, and it's, it's what makes me able to prepare my sermons every week, not to be distracted by, let's make a deal on television. <laughs> or some other foolish thing. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Do you ever think about that? When you're making your bed, or washing the dishes, or you're at work, those of you that still uh, are out working. Do whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. Nehemiah and his people had to work hard to fulfill the goal of rebuilding that wall now, almost 100 years before Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem, the people had been released, all those many Jews that returned to their land. And it, they'd been home for 100 years, and the wall was still not rebuilt. And so I'd ask some of you, are there things you've wanted to do for years but still never got past that dreaming stage? 
You know, there's things you made up. I'm, this year I'm going to, you know. After 100 years, what, what it took was one man determined to get the job done. And Nehemiah got to work himself and made the people work. And they accomplished. Now, a lot of you here, because so many of us are, how shall I say, long in the tooth. <laughs> You're saying, Pastor Bill, I, I've always wanted to fill in the blank, get a degree, write a book, fly a plane, get in shape, oops. But I put it off, it's too late, I'm too old. C.S. Lewis, no less, said this, you are never too old to set another goal or to dress and dream a new dream. Several weeks ago when I was buying the, or going to look at pianos, I should say, it was the 9th of December, and my friend Wayne Montag, who's a piano tuner here in town, tunes all, has tuned all the pianos for every major star in town and knows everything about pianos. He was guiding me through this so I would get the right thing. And we started at a piano warehouse, and then I left there, and I called Wayne, and he said, well, that's a Yamaha, yeah, but it's not the high, highest quality. And so he sent me to Southern Nevada uh, Music on Stephanie in Henderson. And the uh, proprietress, uh, Denise Wunderlich, uh, was showing me uh, a number of Yamaha, used Yamaha pianos, and she was playing on those keys. And suddenly I had this sadness and frustration that just came over me. Because I had taken piano lessons from seventh grade until I was a junior in high school, and then I quit. And after those five years, and I was getting good, but I could not sit and play something to test the piano myself. And uh, I don't know, I, when I was in my junior year, I just felt I was too busy. I had a lot of school work. I was on the forensic uh, league where you'd go and make speeches at different schools and comp compete. And, uh, Boy, I was so sorry for over the years that I quit those piano lessons. My sister, who's here today, who is a piano teacher, as you, many of you know, say she hears this from adults all the time who say, like I did, I could kick myself for quitting lessons when I was a teenager. And the other thing we all say is, I don't know why my parents made me, allowed me to quit. <laughs> you know, we all, it makes you feel better to blame somebody. And parents are fair game. So with that sadness, right then and there at Southern Nevada Music on the ninth day of December, one month, month before my 70th birthday, I thought, I'm taking piano lessons. It is not too late. And instantly that dream and that yearning came along and Stephanie for my birthday bought me a beautiful used Baldwin uh, studio piano that I'm going to practice on. And my first lesson is tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. with my sister. Would you pray for my sister? <laughs> but I had a dream and have a dream and now it's time to get to work and that's the tough part. And working toward a dream will require the second thing, patience. Patience. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control patience. So I looked up, you know, I, I like to like to see a definition, even though we know what a word means. I like to see it spelled out. And this is the definition of patience in the dictionary. The capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble or suffering without getting angry or upset. But I thought that is not a complete definition. That's not accurate. I change it to this, the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering in spite of getting angry and upset. You know, pastoring this church was a dream that began when I was 23 years old, and it was a God-given dream. It was a call, and, and I knew it. It never went away. The Bible says the, the, the call of God is without ev uh, revocation. Uh, it can't be taken away if you're called into something, but I had no idea when I was called at 23 that it would be 51, I would be 51 before that would come to fruition. Now along the way, God had me uh, in various kinds of ministry, uh, most particularly uh, leading worship in various churches. But we're here today on this first day of the year, 2023, because of, of patience. 
not only on my part, but people like Cheryl who've been here from the beginning and have, uh, when we started June the 6th of 2004, we had our first service, we had, uh, the first real service we had, we had 50 people. Or 25 people, sorry. Our first service we had 50 because people came just to support. And then we had 25. And a year later we had 25. And two and a half years later we still had about 25. Then we moved into the library and we began to grow like a weed. <laughs> we got up to 35 in the two and a half, three years that we were there. And in the meantime, I knew pastors that had churches the same uh, length of time that had uh, 1,200 people. And so you go, what's wrong with me? What's going on here? You know, But I kept going. 18 and a half years ago, we, or 18 and a half years into it, we're, we're still under 100 people. That's okay, though. It's a church, and we're doing it like Jim was talking about. We, we're, we're doing things. We're a powerful, we're like Reno. We're the biggest little church. Yeah. <laughs> And along the way, I've had to deal with, and a lot of us have, problem people. Nobody here. <laughs> Nasty building managers. People that leave without a word that you develop friendships with. People that die. Galatians 6, 9 says this, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And that's all about patience. And that's how things get accomplished. Never will I retire. Nothing wrong with retiring from a lot of jobs. If I did this job or that job, I'd be ready to retire, but not this. We have dreams. We have goals to fulfill. I've got a dream to play the piano. I got the piano. I'm going to take lessons. And now comes work <laughs> and patience. And I think... Probably when you attack anything, make a plan to do anything, I think, how am I going to get the time to do this? Because I'm busy right now. Somebody said, let your dreams be bigger than your fears. And so, I'll do 20 minutes here, 15 minutes there, 30 minutes here, you know, patience. Thirdly, seeing your dreams in 2023 carried out requires that you dig down very deep. What's that mean? To work towards something, to work and have patience, those things come together, but it's going to require grit or determination. Right, Jill? <laughs> I see Jill over at my Weight Watcher class every now and then. Yeah, and we're, we're both digging down deep, aren't we? Usually with our fork, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In the musical Gypsy, Mama Rose sings this. Some people sit on their butts. Got the dream, yeah, but not the guts. That's okay for some people who don't know they're alive. Got the dream, but they don't have the guts. People who really accomplish great things, great and small, during their lifetimes, it takes guts and grit and determination. When his enemies tried to distract Nehemiah from building the wall, they didn't want to see that wall completed. We see this famous statement in Nehemiah 6.3. He said this to, in response to his enemies, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work stop? What great work do you have to do? Have you got the grit to stay with it? Back in high school when I started studying, putting my, my nose to the grindstone. I remember particular times, I think in my junior year, I'd be up in my room studying and I'd hear the voice of, voices of my sister and brother down in the living room. Come on down, you're missing this! They were watching laugh-in. And I'd be up there, <laughs> if I go down there and sit on that couch in front of our Magnavox Home Entertainment Center, the one with a TV in the center, and a radio on this side, and a record player and stereo on this side, if I go down there and sit and start watching Laugh-In, I probably won't go back up to my room. It'll be it. And I fought and I stayed up there and I had to say, I'll see you later, Goldie Hawn, Ruth Buzzy. 
Artie Johnson, Joanne Worley, Alan Seuss, Lily Tomlin, Henry Gibson. <laughs> Sacrifices have to be made when you're going to accomplish anything. Nehemiah left a privileged, pampered life for a troublesome and tough life, but a better life. And he saw his people become secure physically and spiritually. So as we close this first sermon on the first day of the first month of a brand new year, what are your dreams in 2023? Are you filled of dreams? Are you, do you even have just one dream you want to see accomplished? Malcolm Forbes said this, when you cease to dream, you cease to live. Dreams keep us going. Now in preparation for that birthday party I'm inviting you to on the 21st of January, I've been watching these uh, DVDs of TV appearances my sister and brother and I did on John Davidson, uh, Merv Griffin, Jerry Lewis Telethon, a whole bunch of things. I'm going to show some of them and weave them in with uh, some other videos and fun things. But as I watched it, I watched my younger self in my 20s and 30s and my younger sister and my younger brother, I felt so proud of hitting, having hit this high mark in the profession of show business and the professionalism that we had done that with. We were unique and no one could top what we did or the way we did it. Oh, there were other impressionists like Rich Little and others, but we were the only two brothers and a sister that did impressions and did them in costume and used our own voices. But when we started out, our dream was to go higher than that. It was to have a, a weekly variety show like Carol Burnett and Sonny and Cher and the Smothers Brothers and people like that. And, and we never got to that point. But Kind of, and now they think about it, in a 30-year career, about 10 years into it, a lot of those shows were already fading out. They were, had other forms of entertainment. But the distance we went was amazing. And what we experienced was absolutely priceless. My parents always said to us growing up, shoot for the stars. If you only make it halfway there, that's higher than you'll get if you don't aim high. W. Clement Stone said it a little differently as we close. He said this, shoot for the moon. If you miss, you may hit a star. Let's close. Lord, I'm so thankful for heartfelt dreams and desires and goals. Even those outside of the kingdom of God accomplish through those heartfelt dreams and through the ingredients that we talked about today, work and patience and determination. But what a blessing it is, Lord, when you yourself plant the dreams in us to accomplish your purpose in us and through us. I'm thankful today, Lord, for that recent desire to get back to piano practicing and to be able to play something on the keyboards and reawaken, Lord, the years that I spent in my teenage years. And I would pray today, Lord, that you will plant new dreams, new desires, new goals in the hearts of people and that those sitting here will know it came from you and that they too will not just dream and continue to dream, but they will put that dream into action and they'll see it carried out. That today's dreams, or today's realities are yesterday's dreams. So we ask you to bless each one here today. I pray, Lord, that hearts have been stirred. I pray that hearts have been stirred by your spirit. I pray, Father, that when we begin, when we end this year and we get ready to go into 2024, that we will say, wow, I have more Bible knowledge than I did a year ago. 
I feel closer to God than I did a year ago. I've cleaned the garage that I've always wanted cleaned. Whatever it is, Father, we pray that you help us to accomplish the dreams you plant. We ask this in Jesus' name. And I would say to each one, a, a blessing over each one. May the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and give you peace in this new year. In Jesus' name, amen.